This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to answer the question, will Evergrande bring down the global financial system? And in order to discuss this, I'm going to sort of use a Scylla and Charybdis metaphor. This is the famous story from Homer's Odyssey, where Odysseus is sailing between two undesirable things. On the one side, we have the whirlpool here, which could swallow the ship. On the other side, we have the six-headed monster. This is sort of a, the modern metaphor, I guess, would be between a rock and a hard place. But this is where I think China is. And in order to understand the Evergrande situation, we need to understand what's going on domestically in China. So on one side, whether it's Scale or Charybdis, we have this new policy of common prosperity, where China has been so successful, they produced too many very powerful billionaires. There's a lot of wealth inequality. And of course, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is very worried about uh, worried about oligarchs and billionaires possibly getting too much power and disrupting the political system. This is what we saw happen to Jack Ma over the past uh, the past, past nine or twelve months. He uh, they canceled one of his IPOs. He disappeared for a while, and he's been very much laying low. I'll link to this article that talks about what's happened to a lot of the other Chinese billionaires. And it does seem to be sort of a crackdown on billionaires. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about today, I'm going to use this Cantonese name because it's easier for me to pronounce. Hui Ka Yan is the billionaire's name. He is the chairman and founder of Evergrande. And Evergrande, if you haven't been following it, it's a property development company based in China. And what they do is they build homes and apartment buildings and then sell them. That's their main business. And in the process, they have to use a lot of debt and a lot of leverage. If you think about it, you have to buy land, you have to buy materials, etc. And then you build a house or you build a building and then you sell it afterwards. So it's a very capital intensive business. This company has been very successful, but recently it's reached the point where whether it's the bubble's been popped by the, the Chinese Communist Party or just by having inherently too much leverage in the company itself because it's pursuing too aggressive of a path in terms of debt, whatever the, the underlying cause, the Evergrande bubble has popped. The stock has gone, this is how it trades on the Hong Kong exchange. The stock has gone from the mid twenties all the way down to about two Hong Kong dollars. Now this makes sense because the bonds are not paying a coupon now and the bonds are senior in the capital structure. So if the bonds are impaired, that means definitely the equity is impaired as well. And so Evergrande has been missing. They have been making their loan payments. And this has been this has been telegraphed by the Chinese housing ministry. Um, and it's causing it's causing a bit of contagion globally. So that's sort of Scylla on the one side where China wants to weaken the hold of the billionaires. And it doesn't care if in the process it hurts foreign investors in these companies. Now, on the other side, uh, if that's Scylla, we have Charybdis, which is the fact that housing, real estate is a very important store of value for people in China. It also is for Chinese Americans. I used to live in a mostly Chinese uh, American neighborhood in the Bay Area, and everyone there, as soon as they had paid off or sufficiently paid down their first home, they would start buying up other homes in the neighborhood. Chinese people traditionally like tangible assets like real estate. As such, this is an old study back from 2015. In this study, it showed that something like 20, 70%, 70%, 70% of household wealth was stored in real estate. And so this is a huge percentage of GDP in China. And this is one of the problems. If you're going to go after the billionaires, uh, and you're going to go after uh, Ever Evergrande, the problem is you might end up hurting the wealth of normal everyday people. If you're finding this video helpful so far, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Also share it with a few friends who may be wondering what's going on with Evergrande. So we have the situation where Evergrande cannot pay its creditors. Now this is very bad for the banking system in China. Evergrande owes money to a lot of banks because it takes out loans to develop these properties. It's also very bad for everyday people who have put down deposits on future houses and now the money's tied up. And there's been some social unrest, which of course is the most 
uh, the thing that the Chinese government is always most worried about. Having massive social unrest puts the, puts the Chinese Communist Party at risk. So we have this situation where, where it's hurting the banking system. It's also hurting the net worth of individual investors and in, in China. Evergrande in the process of trying to, uh, to, to make things whole and uh, right the ship has been dumping as much real estate as it can at discounted prices in order to raise cash to shore up its operations, maybe to begin making bond payments, coupon payments again. In the process, it's offering very big discounts for its properties. And as such, it's driving down real estate pro prices uh, nationwide. Meanwhile, you have people who are panicked about this and know that Evergrande has a lot of assets they need to unload. And so they're trying to front run Evergrande. And the net result is that housing prices on average, as far as I can tell, seem to be down about 20% year over year. And this is quite significant, especially in a country where housing prices have basically gone straight up for the last 20 years. This is also leading not just uh, to problems for Chinese investors, but also for international investors as we're beginning to see what looks like global contagion. This is something that happened really the last time it happened. Uh, we had a little bit of it in March 2020 when COVID hit and everything slowed down and we had asset prices crashing worldwide. That was a very fast recovery. The, the analogy for this is maybe closer to the great financial crisis of 2008 to 2009 where you had a lot of leverage in the system, particularly in the US. You had a lot of subprime loans, housing price appreciation. It never, it never went down at the beginning, but it just began to slow enough such that all the house flippers got into trouble. They began to default on their mortgages. The banks were highly levered. Banks like Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, levered banks began to go down. And the government, the US government and the Fed let a few of them fail, it let Bear Stearns fail and get taken over, it let Lehman Brothers fail. Once Lehman Brothers failed, the whole system began to fall apart. And that's when the, the Fed stepped in and started quantitative easing. It started printing money to buy mortgage-backed securities and to buy government bonds in the U.S. called treasuries. So we had a situation there where a slowing real estate market or a real estate crash began global contagion and stocks crashed, everything crashed in 2008 to 2009. And the only path out or the path that was chosen was central banks printed up a lot of money and used it to prop up asset prices as if they've done over the past 10 years. This is also the genesis when Satoshi saw this, this is when he decided to release Bitcoin in early 2009. The white paper came out in late 2008. So these two things are tied together. Just to give a small demonstration of how contagion might work or how contagion does work, it's not just that you sell off bits of your portfolio when other bits are performing badly. Here's an example of LVMH, Louis Vuitton, uh, Moe Hennessy, global country company, global company that has all these luxury brands. And what happens is when, and, and there's a lot of consumption of these brands, obviously, by the wealthy, particularly in the upper middle class in China buying fancy purses and clothes, etc. And so, when the Chinese economy starts to weaken, it begins to hit. Uh, it begins to hit uh, foreign companies like LVMH, and we can see that their stock price has, has come off quite a bit from call it 720 down to 633. And so, this is how global contagion starts. You begin to get scared. You start losing money in your Chinese ETF, and then so you start selling off a little bit of everything else. And this is, of course the risk. Now, we've been seeing this happening with Bitcoin as well. I've been getting a lot of questions when I've been away about why is Bitcoin crashing at the same time. Well, one, one reason is that Bitcoin is still highly correlated to risk assets. Bitcoin crashed or went down 50% in March of 2020 when everything else was crashing. And here it's going down again. We've gone from the 50,000s back down to the low 40,000s as part of this contagion. So the question we always hear is, is Bitcoin actually store value if it crashes whenever stocks crash, if you have this correlation? And I think one way of answering this is to look at what happened to Apple during the great financial crisis. These are split adjusted uh, prices, but Apple basically went from seven down to, uh, it got cut in more than half. It went down more than 50% over the short term, over uh, 2008 to early 2009. If we zoom out, of course, uh, 
Apple recovered much more quickly and went up much more than the stock market itself. So store value is measured over years and decades. Uh, you can see that, that the move from seven to four doesn't even register on a chart that's now at uh, in the 140s per share. So you have this correlation, but it doesn't mean that over long periods of time that things stay down. Bitcoin crashed from, call it, uh, around 10,000 to around 5,000, 4 or 5,000 in March of 2020, and then it recovered to, uh, call it, uh, 40 to 60,000, went on to hit new highs. So we have had a crash in Bitcoin, but it's still up 4x or 400% over the past year. So this is this is how you have to think about store values. Things can be correlated in the, long t in the short term, as Apple was, and yet over the long term, they can still massively outperform. Here's Apple. Apple's moving down with the rest of the stock market, but it's still outperforming uh, many other things. So in this environment, we don't know yet whether we're going to get true global contagion. One or two down days does not make for a Lehman Brothers-like event. But it's very important at any, it's especially important during good times to pay close attention to what you own, to understand what you own and why you own it. If you own junk just because you think it's going to outperform quality assets, if you own Dogecoin or Solana or XRP or some garbage like this, this is the time that you're probably not sleeping very well at night because this is a speculative asset. It's speculative in a scammy way. It's not speculative like Bitcoin is. It uh, was, was released by a centralized corporation and Ripple's being sued by the SEC, etc. So it's very important to know what you own and why you own it, especially in times like this. If you're trading these markets, pay close attention to your stop loss levels. Don't let a short-term trade become a long-term investment because you're afraid to take a loss. Know where you're gonna, your point of crying uncle is. And the very important thing is to preserve your capital and uh, not to get, if you've gone up 400% this year and then you have a 50% drawdown, uh, that can really eat into your return. So pay close attention to your stop loss levels. I don't have any stop loss levels on Bitcoin for long-term investments. It's much more important just to size the position correctly that you can sleep at night and also to uh, keep money to dollar cost average into it and to understand the fundamental story uh, and what's happening there. It doesn't make sense on a really volatile asset like Bitcoin if you're holding it for the next few decades to have a stop loss. Also, I should point out that September is the cruelest month to, uh, to modify T.S. Eliot's phrase from the wasteland about April being the cruelest month. September is usually a bad time for the stock market and for risk assets in general. October to December tends to be much more bullish. We can see this from Yardini's uh, presentation here where he, where he looks at average percentage changes for the S&P 500 by month. And we can see here, people always associate October with great big crashes like the 1929 crash, the 1987 crash, but it's really September that is a much worse month. And then October, November, and December tend to be very good months for risk assets. It's also a very good time for the consumer to spend a lot of uh, a lot of money going up into the holiday season. So the real uh, twenty-one million dollar question here is: What are the central banks going to do? Here's a uh, this is not a real tweet. This is a pretend headline from Bloomberg that the Fed will purchase one hundred twenty billion dollars worth of Evergrande bonds every month until Larry Fink and Ray Dalio are made whole, obviously tongue in cheek. But this alludes to an important phenomenon, which is that the central banks can step in at any time and stop the carnage. This currency devaluation versus real things is the escape valve. So the Fed can always print up more money like they did in 2009 to the present. They can use it to buy treasuries and keep interest rates low and also buy corporate bonds and move out the risk curve and support the markets. Obviously, the Chinese central bank can do this as well. There's the great meme uh, from the 60 Minutes interview with, Kash with Kashkari. Don't worry, the Fed has infinite cash. And so this is the this is the dilemma that we have. We know that the central banks can stop this at any point, um, and it's just a question of how far they will let it go. I don't think we end up with a great financial crisis this time around. I think central banks will step in. GDP to our debt to GDP levels were much more levered than we ever were before. And the 
the financial markets cannot stand a 50% drawdown. So I think maybe this continues for a few more days or at most a few more weeks, and then the central banks step in. And in the process of stepping in, they're gonna print a lot more money, which is really, really good for Bitcoin. So I personally welcome this chance to be accumulating some more Bitcoin in the lower, low 40,000s. I don't think we break uh, below 40,000 in this move. And I still have a price target of $200,000 for Bitcoin by the end of the year. That being said, we're gonna keep monitoring the situation with Evergrande and the possibility of global contagion. I don't think it happens this time. I think the authorities will be much more proactive, both the Chinese authorities and the Fed. But it will be interesting to see how the Chinese authorities uh, navigate the scale and charybdis of trying to stamp out wealth inequality and leverage in the system, while at the same time uh, not destroying the net worth of ordinary Chinese citizens. I'm currently still on the road. This video, might the sound might be a little echoey. Do let me know what you think of the sound quality. Uh, I'm in kind of a noisy place, so I'm recording this in an echoey closet. We'll see how it turns out when I actually post it. Let me know the sound quality though. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.